Okay, welcome back everybody to our second lecture on BC 308, Revelation and Daniel. Um, we are going to be looking at Revelations chapters 4 and 5. Um, there's a question in the chat from Charles. Could we say the chapters 1, 2, and 3, Jesus uses the known, and chapters 4 going forward, he uses the unknown to speak about the future as he began with the past present. Um, so the known and unknown is, uh, what to say, is with respect to us, right? Of course, to him, he knows all things. He's the Alpha and the Omega, he's the beginning and the ending. So he knows all things. He knows everything, right? So the known and unknown, unknown is from our perspective, and yes, if you want to state it like that, that's fine. We can say past, present, future, all in our, our terms, our language. Uh, but to him, he knows all things. Okay, so what we're going to do is read through chapters 4 and 5, and then I will summarize the key points here from chapters 4 and 5. So chapters 4 and 5 are giving us a scene in the throne room. Okay, now John began in Revelation chapter 1 saying he was caught up, he was taken up in the spirit on the Lord's day. And it is most likely that all of this is, you know, a, 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 a sequence of events that, that, that are being revealed to John. Uh, whether it is happening in that one spiritual experience of being caught up in the Lord's day on starting from Revelation 1, or whether these were two separate experiences, we, we uh, you know, it, it could, you know, be debatable in the sense we're not 100% sure, but it seems like it was one long experience, right? Starting that Revelation 1, it was in the spirit of the Lord's day, the Lord revealed himself to John, and then he he spoke, gave him the message to the seven churches, which is chapters 2 and 3. And then in chapter 4, verse 1, he's having another experience of walking through a door into the throne room. Right? So chapters 4 and 5 is a scene in the throne room, and let's look at that. So can we please read chapters 4 and 5, uh, three verses each. Let's begin with verse 1, Revelation 4. Revelation 4, first verse. After this I looked, and behold, a store standing open in heaven. And the first voice, which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven, with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian. And around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an, of an emerald. Thank you. Was for on, somebody? Around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thundering, and voices, Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirit of God. Before the throne, there was a sea of glass, like crystal, and in the midst of the throne. And around the throne were four living creatures, full of eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second living creature was like a calf. The third living creature had a face like a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever. And the four 
and 20 elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying thou art worthy o lord to receive glory and honor and power for thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created chapter 5 verse 1 and i saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the back side and sealed with seven seals then i saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice who is worthy to open the scroll and to lose its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to lose its seven sins. And I then I saw standing. Go ahead, Asher. And I looked and behold in the midst of the throne, throne and of the <clears throat> four living creatures and in the midst of the elders to the land as though it had been slain having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. <clears throat> and he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each having a harp and a golden and golden uh, bowls of, full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and break its seals. Because you were slaughtered at the cost of blood, you ransomed for God. Persons from every stripe, language, people, and nation, you made them into a kingdom for God to rule. Priests to serve him, and they will rule, forever. They will rule over the earth. Verse 11, someone. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Then the four living creatures said, Amen. And the twenty-four elders fell down and worshipped him who lives forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So chapters 4 and 5. So John, John is invited. This is verse 1. Chapter 4, verse 1. There's a door that opens. The spiritual. And this is his vision. And in the vision, he says, doors open, and he's invited to come. I mean, I was, look, I'm, I'm going to show you more things. So he enters in through the door, and then the voice, the Lord speaks to him and says, look, I will show you, verse 1, I will show you things which must take place after this. That means these are things that are going to take, going to take place. So what is what we read in Revelation 4 and 5 is not, what is happening, but what is going to take place. Now, I know that we have many songs that are written about the throne room worship, you know, the elders falling down and worshiping and all based on Revelation chapter four and five. There's nothing wrong with that because obviously 
in worship in heaven right now there is worship going on and uh, all the angelic beings are worshiping the Lord and so on and so forth so there's nothing wrong with all those with those songs but uh, correctly Revelation 4 and 5 is a scene into the future things which are going to take place out in the future so somewhere out in the future what we are seeing in Revelation 4 and 5 is going to take place what's going to happen the Lord is seated on the throne and uh, there are 24 elders so okay it's another thought that we have to mention here so as John sees all this remember and uh, I may have said this in the very beginning but remember he is seeing things that he's not used to seeing this is not his normal you know things that he sees every day so everything he sees he's going to relate back to things that he knows on the earth and that's why when he says you know I see something like Jasper like Sardis or like emerald he is seeing all these colors and then he's relating it back to stones that he knows on earth right uh, he's seeing you know various things and whatever he sees he's you know he had he has the language he's using the language of earth to communicate to us what he's seeing in the in the throne room in the future so it's it is it is difficult in the sense hey this is what i can relate that to right so when he sees these four living creatures and he says you know one is like a calf and one is like a you know uh, so in his mind that's what it is it doesn't mean there is a calf there or there is an eagle there or uh, you know there's no or a lion there it's just he's saying this looks something like that or it makes you know it reminds me of that okay so understand he's using earthly language to communicate something that he's seeing another important thing to keep in mind is that he is getting an impression of something but what is is slightly different example when he says i'm seeing a lamb as it has been slain with seven horns seven eyes and seven spirits it doesn't mean there's literally a lamb walking in front of the throne of god no this is the son of god this is the eternal word but the impression is this is the Lamb of God and John understands who the Lamb of God is but don't think there's a lamb walking in the throne room with blood dripping from it right but this is him understanding recognizing this is the Son of God the Lion of the tribe of Judah okay so just want to set that background there uh, as we begin to look into this two chapters okay say you have a comment or a question yeah, yeah. so i would just like to ask a question um is there a bit of is there is there hebrew culture here when we read the book of revelations because it seems again that john might be communicating um in terms of what the people the jewish people understood like when you said the lamb of god many of the Jewish people understood what that meant, you know. Mm -hmm. So is there also like culture here that we, maybe we may need to be familiar with? I know the Bible has references to which we can point to, but would that also help in explaining some symbol, some symbolic statements, basically, when John is trying to interpret what he's seen in the heavenly realm to us here on earth? yeah definitely because remember everything john is relating to he is relating to his context which is two thousand years ago life as a jew right there in his time in his day right so he's using as all of scripture so all of scripture is written in a certain time period uh it's written in the language and the culture of 
the writer of that time. So, you know, that's given for all, all of scripture. So John is obviously writing. Uh, he's using language, images, and pictures of his day and time, right? Uh, that this is so literally saying 2,000 years ago, 80, the first 100 years, 80, 90. And he is using his context, which, as you, as you pointed out, is that of a Jew. Uh, and as we progress, you know, as we go through the chapters that come up, there's a lot of reference to Daniel, uh, the book of Daniel, which we have studied, which John obviously has the background to. He understands it. And you will see in Revelation, as we progress, there is that reference as well. So he definitely is writing as a Jew who understands these images, who understands these pictures that he is saying. So the answer to what you said is yes, right? As, as with all of scripture. All of scripture is written in its context by the context of the writer. So thank you, Pastor. So yeah, so what do we see in the throne room? Remember, this is a scene in the future, way out in the future. This is what the scene is going to look like. There's God the Father sitting on the throne, and John is seeing all these vibrant colors that he's relating back to, you know, the colorful stones that he knows, Jasper, and uh, you know, it's like clear diamond and red ruby and um, colorful rainbow and emerald and so on. And then he sees around the throne, he says 24 elders. Now, who are these 24 elders? What do we know about them? Well, uh, we cross-reference. So, you know, uh, later on in Revelation, in Revelation 19.10, one of the, uh, actually in two places, uh, Revelation 19.10, and also uh, in Revelation 22 and verse 9, these elders were speaking to John. In Revelation 19, 10, the elder says, you know, I am your fellow servant and of your brethren. I'm your fellow servant and of your brethren. And then again in Revelation 22 and verse 9, uh, he says this again. He says, I am your fellow servant and of your brethren, the prophets. So we cross-reference. Now, of course, John John wants to worship, right? He, you know, who's a spiritual being? Uh, I've got to worship him. And he says, don't worship me. You have to worship God. I am your fellow servant, and I'm of your brethren, the prophets. So, you know, we have that little indicator. Uh, we can also cross-reference, you know, in the, in the, in the Gospels when, uh, when, uh, when, when, uh, uh, the, the the mother of James and John comes and says, "Hey, will you let my son sit around your th you know around your throne next to you?" He says, "That's not for me to decide. It's what the Father will decide." Um, when you look at later on in Revelation twenty, the twelve apostles of the Lamb, uh, they are part of the foundation of that heavenly city, Jerusalem. So they they're honored that way. So, what can we say about these? 24 elders, we don't know their names, but from these cross-referencing, uh, we could say, you know, they are Jewish. They uh, could be the prof. Some of, some of them could be the prophets because one of them said, I am your fellow servant. I am of your brethren, meaning Jewish, and I am of the prophets, you know, Revelation 22, 9. So, okay, so, you know, those are clues for us. Uh, so we could say maybe 12 of them are Old Testament prophets and 12 of them could be the apostles of the Lamb. We don't know for sure, right? But these are people, people, not angelic beings. The 24 elders are people who have been given that privileged place to be seated there around the throne room, the 24 elders. So... What we can also say is these elders are wearing white robes and crowns. So white robes and crowns are rewards given. We saw in the chapters 2 and 3. Uh, the white robe, crown, these are rewards that are given to these elder, to God's people. So we can say that you know, by, by the fact that we see these 24 elders seated on the throne, around the, the throne of God, 
with their white robes and crowns, it's likely that um, the saints have been brought into heaven and they have been, they have received their rewards and they are now, these elders have been made to sit around the throne. So, this is one way to infer, and I'm just saying it's an inference, it's not a clear statement, but it's an inference we are making, that because these elders are seated there with their rewards on, meaning they've got their white robes and they've got the crowns, and they're seated on the throne, all of these are rewards, we infer that the church has been brought up into heaven and uh, awards have been given to those who have served the Lord. Okay, so this is only an inference. It's not a clear statement. Okay, so we're seeing these elders around the throne. And then we are seeing these four angelic beings. Um, these are different angelic beings. They are, you know, like John says, one looked like a lion, one looked like a calf. And so he's using earthly pictures to try to correlate what he's seeing. Uh, doesn't necessarily mean they look exactly like that. There be maybe some resemblance. Uh, but these four living creatures, which generally people would refer to them as cherubims, reason being they're not the same as other angels who bring messages or angels who uh, engaged in worship, seraphims, uh, or angels who are uh, carrying out an assignment. You know, either they are carrying messages or they are doing battle on behalf of God's people. But these are living creatures around the throne, always engaged in worship. And uh, so these living creatures are typically referred to as cherubims around the throne. So they are in constant worship, constantly proclaiming holy, holy, holy. Now, before the throne, this is, I'm looking at verse 5. There are seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Okay, so here again, like we said in the very beginning, don't take these seven spirits uh, to represent seven Holy Spirit, no. John is seeing something that he can understand, like lambs, the presence of the Holy Spirit, conveyed to him like that. But really, there's only one Holy Spirit. And so seven here should be understood as symbolic, seven lamps of fire, symbolic, representing the presence of the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit. Before the, in the throne room. Seven meaning perfection, completion. Okay? So the presence of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the living God, in the throne room is communicated to John in this manner. Okay? But don't say there are seven Holy Spirits because there were seven lamps of fire. No. It's symbolic communicating to John this is the presence of the Holy Spirit. Say you have a comment or a question. Yes, sir, Pastor. Uh, I have two things. I know Jesus said we shouldn't add to whatever John had said. But I, I, again, we see culture and, you know, Hebrew context and Jewish context. I'm just wondering, uh, the, se the sevenfold spirit, as some uh, the, um, versions will say, or the seven spirits, is it referring to Isaiah 11, verse 1, where it says that uh, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, Spirit of wisdom and uh, uh, and understanding, the spirit of uh, of might and um, knowledge. I, I can't remember exactly, but it mm -hmm. just gives me a list of the seven, uh, the sevenfold or the seven, or let's say maybe seven expressions of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And again, we we see again uh, a representative of the menorah. You know, the menorah that has six branches and then one. Again, again, all symbolic of the Holy Spirit. So I don't know. Is this what John was communicating when he says the sevenfold spirits? I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. So as you're 
Isaiah 11, 1 and 2, we, we read about the seven facets of the one Holy Spirit, right? He is the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, and the fear of the Lord, the seven facets of the Holy Spirit. Now, whether John was thinking about that or not doesn't seem, you know, you know we don't know, but yes, we can, we can always correlate that, that there's one Holy Spirit, but there are seven facets to him, seven and more, right? Isaiah 11, verse 1 and 2, talk about the seven facets of the Holy Spirit, but he doesn't have just seven, he has more. Um, so, when he's talking about the seven lamps, yes, we can correlate it with the lamp and the tabernacle, just like we saw the lamp represents, you know, in, in chapters 2 and 3, the lamp stand representing the church can be correlated to Zechariah 12, where Zechariah has the vision of the olive oil and the lamp representing spiritual leaders. Um, so, yes, the, the symbol of the lamp is the lamp stand is there in their culture in the Old Testament. We see the lampstand in the tabernacle. Uh, we see the lampstand in Zechariah 12. So we see that. But uh, I, I think the, the main takeaway here is, you know, uh, not to... So this is symbolic, the seven lamp, because in verse 5, it's self-explanatory. What do the seven lamps of fire, he's seeing seven lamps of fire, which is common. It's a common image for the Jewish mind. They've seen it in many places. They see it in the tabernacle, the seven lamps. But in verse 5, he's talking about the spirits of God. Like we saw earlier in Revelation 1 and uh, uh, verse 4, the seven spirits. And remember at that time, we, we mentioned these things. That seven is perfection. It's a number for perfection, but there's only one Holy Spirit, right? So keep that in mind as we uh, as we look at you know that these are images, but the image is communicating something to John and to us. One Holy Spirit in the presence of the in the throne room before the throne of God. So we we see these. Uh, living creatures, they're engaged in worship. They constantly, and what's, what's important, verse 8, these living creatures are constantly acknowledging the holiness of God. And that's something to think about. God is good, but these living creatures are not saying good, good, good. God is compassionate. These living creatures are not saying, you know, God, you're compassionate or you're merciful or you're gracious. The one thing these living creatures are constantly using or engaging in worship is the holiness of God. So the holiness of God is what you could what we could say is it's the core aspect of his nature, which means everything else about God is wrapped or is intertwined with His holiness. So God is love, but His love is never outside of holiness. God is compassionate, but He's never compassionate outside of holiness. Uh, God is gracious, but He's never gracious outside of holiness. That means the core aspect of, the, of God is holiness. Like in the Old Testament, we see, and, and you know, I think in the second year, we did this study on the holiness of God. The holiness of God adorns his house. Uh, we worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Every worship of God has to happen in the context of holiness. Outside of holiness, worship, true worship cannot happen. Right? So that's just here, based on verse 8, an emphasis on the holiness of of God, right? And at this time, the elders are bowing down and worshiping God. So while, and I remember all of this is out in the future. So while John is seeing this worship of God, there's the Father, the Holy Spirit is present, four living creatures are there, 24 elders who have been, you know, clothed in white, given their crowns, they're all seated, they're all worshiping. At that time, 
So somewhere out in the future, at that time, verse 1, Revelation 5, verse 1, the Father stretches out a scroll. Now the scroll is symbolic, the book called the scroll, symbolic of all the prophetic words that are yet to be fulfilled. We saw that in Daniel 12, you know, the angel Gabriel told Daniel, Daniel, write it down, seal it. All this is sealed until the time of the future. So somewhere in the future, this is going to happen. The father pulls out his scroll. Meaning, these are prophetic utterances, things that are waiting to be fulfilled. And then there's a cry in heaven saying, hey, who can take the scroll and open its seal? Meaning, who can set these things into motion? Who's going to set? The opening of the scroll is uh, representing setting all of these prof prophetic utterances into motion. Who can do it? Nobody's worthy to do it. So the throne room, Father is there, the Spirit of God is there. And then in comes Jesus. So remember, uh, was Revelation 5, 5 and 6. Again, this is communicating to John in the way he understands, right? Lion of the tribe of Judah, root of David, Lamb of God. John recognized this is the Son of God. Who is this one who is walking in? He is the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the King. He is the descendant of David. He is the one who was slain for the sins of the whole world. That's what's qualified him now. He comes and he is perfectly anointed. Seven horns, seven eyes, seven spirits. Seven horns, omnipotence. Seven eyes, omniscience. Seven spirits, omnipresence. Perfectly anointed, perfectly power, full of power, full of knowledge, omnipresent, present everywhere. He comes and he takes the scroll. So somewhere in the future, the Lord Jesus is going to take the scroll, meaning he's going to set things in motion. He's going to open the seal, one after the other, saying all these things are going to start happening. So at that moment, when Jesus comes to take the scroll from the hand of the Father, there is great worship. Now, verse 8, it's talking about these living creatures and 24 elders. Uh, you can see they're having a harp. That means there is music in heaven. Right? So it doesn't mean just one harp, but you know, all of them are having a harp. There's, there's plenty of music happening in heaven. So can, in the side note, can instruments be used in worship? Hey, they are being used in worship in heaven. So why can't we use instruments in worship here on earth? So some people say, hey, in the entire New Testament, you don't find people worshipping with instruments. Well, you've got it right here in Revelation. They're worshipping in heaven with instruments. So it's perfectly fine to do it here on earth. right? And of course, we can look, point them back to the Old Testament as well. So they're worshipping the harp. And there's bowl, there's the prayers of the saints uh, coming before the throne of God. So basically, there's worship and there's prayer that's in the throne room. And now they're going to sing a new song. And it, you know, they describe the song that they are singing. But this is the moment when all of the prophetic scriptures, the utterances that have been given, is going to be unlocked for it in order for it to start to happen. And then there's worship happening. So chapters 4 and 5, a scene of the throne room when Jesus comes and says, let these pro prophetic utterances start happening. Chapter 6, verse 1, he opens the first seal. That means now these prophetic utterances begin to happen. And then we have a detail starting with chapter 6, verse 1, of what are the things that are going to happen. Is everyone with me so far?
Okay, so let's jump into chapter six and let's read verses one through eight, please. Revelation six, one through eight, please. Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say with a voice like thunder, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a white horse. He who sat, sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him. And he went out conquering and to conquer. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, saying, Come and see. Another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take uh, peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another. And there was given to him a great sword. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, the black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him, was death, and hell followed with him, and power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth, to kill with sword, and with hunger, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. And mm. when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God, and for the testimony which they held. Okay, thank you. So, Remember, all of these things, starting from chapter 4, are out in the future, going to happen. So chapter 4 and 5, in the throne room, Jesus has come and taken the scroll, which are all the prophetic utterances, things that are going to happen. And chapter 6, verse 1, the Lord Jesus opens the first seal. So just to, and I think we are familiar with this, in the book of Revelation, there are three sets of major judgments. Each set has seven judgments. So there are seals, trumpets, and bowls. Seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls. And each represents something happening. So as Jesus takes the scroll and he opens the first seal, I mean, okay, this is the first thing that's going to happen. What do we see? As Jesus opens up these seals one after the other, the first seal, and very interesting, is the first four seals are depicting a, a horse. A horse. So, obviously, remember, I mean, remember all of these is prophetic imagery. That means the horse shouldn't be taken as a literal somebody coming riding on this horse, you know. No. The horse represents. It's symbolic. It's talking about strength and it's always talking about speed, meaning these things are going to happen very quickly and they're going to happen very forcefully. So the first thing is this. We see a man. This is Revelation 6, verse 2. And uh, so John is invited to come and see. You know, what's, what's the result of the first seal being opened? Come and see, John. And so remember, all of these things are visions John is being given. They're not literally happening, it's, but it's like a movie that's being played out for John about things which are going to come, okay? So John is having visions. He's seeing all these things in visions. They're not literally happening. They're going to happen, but he's being given, okay, it's like this movie is being played out for him, and he sees a man on a white horse. Now, we refer to him as the Antichrist. Because he is not the Christ. The real Christ in Revelation 19 also comes riding on a white horse. But he is the Christ, the real Christ. This is the Antichrist. And he's, he has a bow. He has a crown representing authority. 
And what's he doing? He's conquering and con he goes out to conquer. I mean, he's exercising authority and influence on over the world. So the first big the beginning of the tribulation, the beginning of all of these things. It starts with the emergence of this man on the white horse who has a bow talking about his military power and strength who has a crown talking about his authority and influence and he's conquering and conquering he's gaining influence this is the antichrist so the seven years of tribulation begins with the emergence of the antichrist the rider on the white horse the first seal and we have shown earlier from uh, in, in our earlier course in the end times that the church has been taken out of the way how do we know that because second thessalonians chapter 2 paul says there's only one thing that restrains this man of sin the son of perdition from being manifested or revealed and when that which restrains is taken out of the way then he will be re revealed so the church has been taken out of the way revelation 4 and 5 we are seeing these, uh, you know, the people there, the, the elders there, they receive their crowns, and uh, along with all the angelic beings, the saints are in, in worship. The church is taken out of the way, and here comes the first thing the Antichrist emerges. And right after that, the everything on earth is set into something, you know, we call it the tribulation. Rightly so, the Bible calls it the tribulation. The second half of that seven year period is called the great tribulation, meaning things are going to get even worse. But with the emergence of the Antichrist, all kinds of things are going to uh, take place. So, Charles, your question so the restrainer is Satan. No, 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 no. The restrainer is the church. The church is taken out of the way. So, the one who holds the enemy, the Antichrist, from being made visible is the church. And when the church was so far restraining him from being manifested, is taken out of the way, Second Thessalonians chapter 2, then he comes, right? So the second seal, which is a red horse, I mean something that's going to happen very fast, very forcefully, uh, is that people, there is going to be war. You see, that's verse 4. People are killing one another with a great sword. Now, again, remember. The languages of John's time. In, during John's time, there were no, you know, uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles that he could imagine. No nuclear warheads and no, you know, drones and uh, all those kinds of things. No. So he's he has to describe war in the language he has, which is bow and sword, bow and arrow and sword. That's all, right? Uh, if God showed him a uh, missile flying through. <laughs> You know, John would say, John would describe it as you know a big rock with point, a pointed rock flying in the sky or something. You know, he he has no he, he obviously would not be using language of our day, right? So God is showing him war in language he understands, which is bow and sword and so on. But basically, the second seal is representing war breaking out on the earth. Third seal, black horse, representing famine. Why? Because food is being measured out to people. And people are saying, don't touch the oil and wine. I mean, hey, that's scarce. Don't touch those lug luxury uh, items. You know, food is scarce. That's verses four and five. There is a dearth, a shortage of food. Okay. Then the fourth seal, this is verse seven, is death. People are dying. And cause of death is given in verse 8. People are dying because of war, hunger, and even animals are killing people. So somehow there's the beasts of the earth, animals are now invading, you know, uh, coming in to kill people. So, uh, and we have these things happening these days also, you know. Uh, we have encroached on uh, areas, uh, uh, areas where you know wild animals are living, and 
And so you have all these stories of wild animals attacking people because we've encroached on their space. But here we're saying the beasts of the earth are killing people, right? So there is death happening. That's the fourth seal. The fifth seal, verse 9, are people are being killed, martyred for the word of God and the testimony they're holding. So you can imagine this. The moment Jesus takes the scroll and he opens the scroll, opening the seals one after the other, here on earth, things are happening. The Antichrist comes in. He comes as a man on a white horse, you know, pretending to be a good person. But with him emerging on the scene, the earth is set into what we call the tribulation. All kinds of things are happening. War shortage of food, people dying because of various reasons, hunger, and beasts of the earth killing them. And then we're also seeing people are being killed for following Jesus Christ. That's verse 9. They are being slain for the word of God and the testimony they held. So th will there be people in the tribulation who will be believers in Jesus Christ. Yeah, of course. We see them right here, verse 9. They're holding out of the word of God. They're holding out to the testimony in Jesus. So these are people, obviously, who, who have come to faith in Christ after the rapture. They've come to faith in Christ, but they are being martyred for their faith. Right. So let's just maybe read a few more verses, till um, just the next two verses, which is 10 and 11. Uh, I think we'll pick up with verse 12 next week. Verses um, 10 and 11. Somebody could read that. And, and they cried out a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, does you not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also of their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Mm. I reached out. Okay. All right. Thank you. So we will pick up from verse 12 next week. But what we're seeing here is this, that verse 9 to nine to 11, the fifth seal is telling us that on the earth, there are going to be a lot of people who are killed for their faith in Jesus. And it's going to continue because the question is, oh Lord, you know, how long is it going to go on? How long are people going to be killed? And he says, look, this is going to go on for some time, right? You have died, you've come into the presence of God, you wait here, you rest here for a while, you have your robe of righteousness that's given to you, you wait here, but people are going to be killed during that seven years. And we will see this happen again in chapter 7. You'll see more people uh, being killed. But that's another thing that will happen during that time here on earth. Okay, uh, we'll pause here. I was uh, intensely going a little fast uh, because I wanted to uh, kind of cover cover ground. Um, but um, yeah, thanks. Uh, we will pick this up from verse 12 next week. And uh, I'm sure, thank you, we can keep up the space. You should be able to go through this entire book of Revelation before. The plan is to finish up by middle of April. So I could uh, then post the assignments and give you sufficient time to work on things. All right. Let's wrap up, please. Let's close in prayer. Could somebody pray with us and dismiss? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for teaching us the hidden things that are yet to happen. You revealed them to someone a long time ago, around 2,000 years ago. We are still learning about them. Lord, we pray that you will continue to 
explain them to us so that we shall live a life that understands the times and seasons, like the sons of Issachar. We continue to thank you for our teacher, and we pray that even as we continue to do the whole book of Revelation, that we shall get more insights and be able to even pass the upcoming exams. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Let's take a break, and we'll see you in the next class. Thank you. God bless. Bye now.